Before we broke, we were uh, working on um, building schema and putting a little bit of data into the system. And now we're going to talk more about the transaction model in Datomic. And uh, I was challenged over lunch to make sure that I talk about fancy pants things like linearizability and serializability and that sort of stuff. So we'll do a little bit of that too along the way. So Datomic's model for transactions mm -hmm. is ACID. It's very traditional like SQL databases. And just to drill into that, um, atomic means in Datomic that a transaction is a set of datums. So the atomic property means that if you tried to put 41 datums into the database, one of two things can happen. Either 41 datums get added to the database, or nothing gets added to the database. So there's no 22 atoms get added to the database, or there's no, you know, uh, any other mode besides either that happens or it doesn't. Um, <coughs> consistent, when you're trying to do <coughs> complicated things and coordinate activity across machines in order to achieve right scale, there's a ton of hard work you have to do um, to think about consistency. But Datomic does not work that way. And so we're not trying to achieve right scale. And so we want to have uh, the most rigorous kind of consistency that we can, which is that all processes see the same global ordering of transactions. So if there are 10 processes in the system, um, they will all see transaction 1, followed by transaction 2, followed by transaction mm -hmm. 3, uh, and so on and so forth. This is in contrast with uh, what people call eventually consistent systems. On an eventually consistent system, you could see something that you later have to say, you know what, I didn't really see that. Right? I saw three happen before two, but it turns out I was wrong. Things didn't happen in that order. And when you're programming against an eventually consistent system, you have to be very thoughtful about what kind of assumptions you're making about reality because you don't know reality in that kind of uh, bedrock way. Now, there are places where you have to make that trade-off. They are uh, relatively few in the kinds of information system work a lot of people do, certainly in the kind of work that I do. And so, you know, Datomic leans all the way over the other way. Now, having said that, um, traditional databases do uh, a lot of hanky-panky with consistency, right? They say we're acid, but then consistency is a knob. So you can turn the consistency knob down. And why would somebody turn the consistency knob down? The primary reason is to win benchmark games against their competitors, right? So they're going to say, you know what? We're consistent, but we're just as fast as Mongo and just as scalable as Mongo if you turn the consistency down to we forget everything right when you put it in, right? <laughs> because then it's super fast because all we have to do is just ignore everything you're saying and return a success code. So, and of course, there's all kinds of knobs in between. Datomic has no knobs on consistency, right? There's no win a benchmark game, make crap data, that you can't understand later setting. So we're extremely hardcore about this. Um, so uh, Datomic is isolated. And um, I should really amend this slide. Datomic on-prem was isolated because it was a single writer system. So there was one process that was different from all the other processes called the transactor. So the transactor transacts, and then the, all the other processes in the system were called peers. And they all had equal access to the data, but only one of them transacted. It turns out that that is uh, not actually why um, we have these properties. Uh, actually, the operations against storage are conditional or transactional at the layer of the underlying storage. So in Datomic Cloud, when you perform a transaction, there's a conditional put to Dynamo, and different processes could race to make that put. So I could show up and say, hey, I have transaction four, and another process in the cluster could show up and say, I have transaction four. And what's going to happen? One of them is going to succeed in making a conditional put. I am moving the world from 3 to 4. The other one is going to get back an error code that says, sorry, you do not get to move the world from 3 to 4 because the world already moved. You missed your chance. And that underlying primitive means that if multiple processes are racing, you're still guaranteed to have the properties that we want, which is either someone's, you're, you're going to succeed or you're going to fail, and fail means nothing happened, not some partial thing happened or eventual consistency or anything like that. Now, having said that, it would not perform very well if we had a cluster of 10 machines and they were all just allowed to race. Right? If you were you know, sending load to all 10 machines and they were all racing you know, to access this, then they would, they would be failing all the time. So inside the cluster, 
Datomic will have a preferred node for a database. So, and it knows which one it is, and it chooses it via consistent hashing on the, some identifier about the database. And so if you had a cluster of six machines in your primary compute group, the database would be transacted primarily by one of those six machines. Now, what happens when things go haywire? Well, if that machine is unreachable, then the other machines will try to transact, and performance will degrade. Those are the breaks, right? Which is not different from how the you know, eventually consistent crazy write scale systems perform, right? They degrade it, you know, when machines are, are behaving badly. Um, and then finally, um, everything should be flushed through to durable storage before reporting that the transaction is complete. So when you uh, send a transaction into the system, when you get back a return code saying that that transaction is done, and in our case that's the value before and the value after and the datums and whatever, that means that the transaction has been written to durable storage. Now, does that mean that you can recover from the transaction if an asteroid hits the Earth splitting it in half? Not necessarily, right? You know, disaster recovery is still is a thing separate from durability. But from the perspective of the system, the, the, when you talk about durable in the acid properties, this means we have put the data in durable storage. Now, it turns out that Datomic on the cloud, on AWS, has a great story about durable storage because the durable storages that Datomic uses there are themselves redundant and replicated and have high uh, availability and high reliability in terms of getting out your data. And we then turn around and put it in multiple stores anyway. So <laughs> Datomic could survive Amazon turning off one of their storage services permanently. One hopes that that wouldn't happen. Um, but that, that redundancy on top of redundancy means that this durability story is very strong against uh, accidents and problems and so forth. So any questions about the linearizability or serializability or any of the illities of transactions before we go on. Yes, Paula. When the kernel loads the system, but not in the cloud, um, when the system reports back that this is the end of the transaction, I'm done, is that saying that the data is on disk or the operating system says that it's, that it's been written? So, I mean, so, this, uh, so now we're going into like why you want to be on cloud and not running on. So you're talking when you're running Datomic on-prem. So, yeah, you can break this. So, Datomic uses um, flush and all the things that you want to do to say, tell me the absolute truth about what you've put on disk. But if you bought some disk that promised incredibly fast performance on benchmarks because they were doing something clever, like holding stuff in memory on the disk and, and acknowledging rights, then we can't, uh, we can't work around that. So, one of the things about running on-prem is all the problems at the edges are on you to understand and understand what the semantics of uh, of your things are. That being said, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm just looking back over like the last five years. I cannot recall a single recorded instance of Datomic losing data because of failing a semantic promise. So we had one situation where a customer lost data because they misconfigured Cassandra, and they set Cassandra to a replication factor of one. So they were basically saying, you know, just you know, run screaming naked through the woods until something goes wrong. And when that, that machine you know, fell over, then they lost their data. We can't, this is the kind of thing that you cannot fix when you let uh, other people touch software. So, which is a great prop, value prop of running on AWS, right? I mean, in theory, Cassandra is amazing. And in practice, it is amazing, right? Cassandra is an amazing piece of tech, and you know, people have a lot of success with it. Um, but you know, if I meet a random person and they say they're running Cassandra, I think they, they're at more risk of data loss than someone who's using DynamoDB. They might be at less risk. They might be more operationally sophisticated than uh, the Amazon's team is, but I just assume on average that they're probably not. Um, and we'll see if there's another, thing another point I wanted to make about that, and now I've lost it. Oh, well. Oh, the other, the other situation um, where we had a, a customer who lost data they called delete database on their production system. And uh, we were actually able to go and spelunk and recover the root nodes of the trees and rebuild it even though they had done that. So there was enough, you know, because if you think about, I mean, we haven't really talked about what Datomic stores, but Datomic stores these very wide branching factor trees, right? So an index in Datomic is a root node that points to some middle nodes, that points to some leaf nodes. Um, 
if you can find that root node, even though nobody's pointing to it anymore because something's been deleted, and then the nodes that it points to are still there, they haven't gone away, right? And when you delete a database in Datomic, there's, there's two steps. There's like not pointing to it, and then there's like garbage collecting and going and actually getting that stuff off the disk. In this particular case, the customer had deleted the database, but between their backups and what had not been purged from the disk, we were able to actually completely rebuild the trees, even though they had not recommended, right? Don't do that. But, but it's cool, and it's a, it said, you know, it falls out of, you know, what's the magic sauce that makes everything better? Mutability. Mutability. Yes. Um, are you going to talk about storage in a little uh, more detail? Storage? Yeah. No, let's talk about storage now if we're going to. Um, when you create another database, does that effectively point to a new root node in the tree? Are they separate trees? Yes. So every database is its own tree. And in fact, so the question was, when I create a new database, is that a different root node? Yes. And, uh, and both Datomic on-prem and Datomic cloud have a catalog, which is a separate data structure that's keeping track of, which also needs to be durable and blah, blah, blah. But that catalog data structure is keeping track of the databases that exist. And in cloud's case, the databases that have been marked as deleted and so on and so forth. Um, another advantage of cloud that I don't really talk about in these slides is that all of those operational things, uh, some of the operational things you know, we give you the ability to do when you're running on-prem. So like uh, garbage collecting your storage, you can do or not. And so, you know, one of our occasional support calls is, you know, somebody will not have noticed that part of the documentation and they'll run Datomic on their test system and then they'll convert it into their production system and they'll have thousands and thousands and thousands of databases that were made and deleted in CI and they're not cleaned up. Uh, uh, on uh, uh, Datomic Cloud, uh, there are background processes that run in the primary group that do all the housekeeping, right? So there's no housekeeping stuff that it's ever on you to know when to schedule it or worry about any of that stuff. Yes, again. Yes, we will talk much more about setting up test environments later, so let's come back to that. Another question. So it is one writer per database, and that's always true. And, uh, but, but with Datomic Cloud, it's not even a single writer system, right? It is a pref it's really a preferred writer system. So the cluster has six nodes in it. One of them is preferred for this database, but if that database, if that node's not available, you can still write. So that is, this is different, and it's a straight-up improvement over Datomic on-prem, where if the transactor's unavailable, you're down for writes until another transactor becomes available. Here, any machine can write. So, so there is a choice to be made, which is how many machines do I want to have in my primary group? And that's the only choice you make. And by default, you have two. And I would say that 95% of the systems that we've ever supported people on, two would be plenty. Right? I mean, the vast majority of database, I mean, there are a few people who have really big, really weird problems. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of actual people writing actual systems are smaller problems, at least in terms of volume and, and number of databases and so on. But, you know, you might be in a different situation. So you could uh, turn that number up. The, the uh, customers that we're helping scale Datomic Cloud right now, it's been primarily about getting them to start using query groups and move the query off of the, the transacting nodes onto their own dedicated compute resources. You're much more likely to start up a query group than you are to expand the size of your compute group that does transacting. But we'll talk about all this operational stuff at the end. So let's hold the operational questions. So we have a whole module on that, and I don't want to get too... Uh, down into that right now. Yes? One moment. About durable. Uh, when you say flush to uh, durable storage, do you mean uh, flush to the, the local cache, flush to the dynamic D, or flush to the whole uh, underlying uh, machinery? To S3, dynamic D, and the local cache. So the question is, I'm scared you said flush. What are you, what are you actually doing? And the answer is we do the most reliable thing that the API makes available in every case. So whatever the thing is that says, I absolutely have it, that's the API that we use. So there's never a place where we say, oh, you could have, maybe have it. So where we meet Amazon's APIs, we meet them at, I got it, right? And then where we meet, if you're looking at on-prem, you know, you can break it, right? You could find ways to, like, mess around with the durability of your SQL store or your Cassandra or whatever, 
um, you could mess around with those configurations and break it, and we can't stop you from doing that. Oh, no, only when Dynamo is happy. Okay. The transaction, I, sorry, I misunderstood the question. The transaction is delivered when Dynamo is happy. And when Dynamo is happy, you have it on multiple machines and the ability to recover it, and right, it so. To your own distributed, a distributed transaction load, load. Yes. And then you say, okay. Yes, we're happy when Dynamo DB is happy. Yeah. All right, we've talked a lot about the concepts behind this. Let's look at the mechanics. At the bottom, Everything's made of datums. And so you can assert things or retract things. And everything in transactions is data. So an assertion is a list, a list that begins with db add. Everything that starts with db, remember, is special and owned by Datomic. db add followed by an entity ID, followed by an attribute, followed by a value. Or you can db retract entity ID, attribute, value. Um, you could program Datomic a long time without uh, issuing explicit retractions. Because when something is cardinality one, if you update it, Datomic will make a retraction for you, right? So if I was only allowed to like one thing and I started liking pizza, I have to stop liking broccoli if I've marked that attribute as cardinality one. Now, how many people want to have to manufacture lists like this to put data in your database? This is a bit of a trick question. If I told you you had to manufacture lists like this to put data in your database, you would actually be better off than with almost Im every imperative database out there. Right, because what do the imperative databases tell you you have to do? You have to open a transaction, which is like, okay, now I'm competing with everybody else for resources until I say close transaction, and then you have to run around and do stuff. So, but I'd like it to be a little bit better than this, because normally when I'm thinking about my data, I'm thinking in terms of entities, not individual facts. And so an entity map is just a way of saying, I want to make multiple assertions about the same entity. And it is exactly equivalent to a list of assertions. So on the top here, I'm saying that 42 likes pizza, 42's first name is John, and 42's last name is Doe. And in the bottom, I'm saying exactly the same thing. There is somebody whose DBID is 42, so DBID is special, it's not really an attribute. DBID is 42, that entity likes pizza, the first name is John, the last name is Doe. This latter formulation is a lot more like objects and object-oriented programming, or like maps, right? It's just this data. And these can be nested. So you can have a map where maybe John had friends. And so under friends, there would be more entities. And then under there, those friends could have likes and so on and so forth. All that nests arbitrarily. So the job of putting data into your system is a job of building a data structure. What is the implication of this for unit testing? Do you need your database to do unit testing of this? Absolutely not. You might want your database for integration testing, for seeing things go end to end, but you never, ever need a Datomic database to test making a transaction, because making a transaction is an operation that is produce a piece of data. Produce a piece of immutable data, remember the magic sauce that makes everything better, uh, that you're going to then send to the database. Datomic allows you to use what are called temporary IDs. So you can say there's some person whose name is Bob, and the DBID, instead of a number, is a string. When you use a string, you're saying, you know what? I don't know Bob's ID, and I don't care yet. Maybe I'll care later. But I don't know what Bob's ID is. But there's this other person, Alice, whose ID is A, and Alice is friends with Bob. So that friends attribute is a reference attribute, and that B automatically resolves to Bob. What this lets you do is it allows you to talk about relationships between things in your transaction data without knowing the actual IDs of things. Because sometimes you don't care, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes the things don't exist in the database yet, so they don't have IDs. So this uh, allows you to do cross-references. And these are what are called string temp IDs. So A here that identifies Alice and B that identifies Bob are string temp IDs. Yes, question? So integers are permanent IDs assigned by the database. So whenever you see an, an integer in entity position, that is a permanent ID in Datomic Cloud. That is a permanent ID assigned by the database. 
And a string is a temporary ID where you're saying, I, I don't want to know about this yet. Yes? So the question is, if I wanted to have a global identifier? Yeah. So yes, you could assign something a global identifier. And let's come back to that in a second, because we'll see that in just a few slides. Yes? Sure. So yes, this doesn't care. This is going to put this, so, so internally the engine is going to say, I have a set of things that have IDs. I'm going to recursively traverse those until they're cleaned up, until I get to a fixed point and I know what everything is. So yeah, it doesn't care if those are recursive. So everything nests. So if you are making an order, orders have line items. So order, line items, and then line items is a collection of, I'm ordering one chocolate and two whiskeys which sounds like something I might be doing later today. So the point here is that you put data into Datomic with maps, by and large. You can use the underlying list form, right? You can do db add or db retract in a list, but you primarily put data into Datomic with maps. And those maps are fundamentally open, right? They represent data you found out in the world. So there's not these slots, right? You didn't make this preconceived commitment to there's these five slots and those six slots and whatever. And because they nest, you can do you know, quite elaborate things that start to look more like telling the complete story of an entity and its related things. You can do all of that in one place. All right, so now we're going to come to UUIDs and things like that and talk about identity. So there are a lot of different notions of identity in Datomic, and it's important to keep them straight. The first one is a database relative ID. So this is an ID that's guaranteed to be unique only in the database. This is the entity ID. This is the number that's stored in E position in the data. It's the number that you get back from a transaction saying, well, you created Jane Doe, and Jane Doe is entity number 71. That 71 is assigned by the system. In a certain sense, it's not that different from a, a generated key in a relational database, right? This is the number we're going to assign this entity. That is unique only within the database, and it's a long, and you should treat that long as being opaque. So you don't really know what's inside that number. I mean, you could, but you don't need to uh, in ordinary operation. A lot of times, things out in the world will have external IDs. So something has a natural uh, ID that is, like we're going to say you have to log in with your email, and two people can't have the same email address. So we're going to call login slash email unique. Those external IDs, you set the attribute of the attribute to be unique identity. So you say that the login email attribute itself has an attribute, which is that it has to be unique. And typically, that's going to be done with strings or UUIDs or URIs. Those are the kinds of things that you would typically make unique. It would be a little bit odd to have a unique Boolean, right? Because you could only have two of them, for example. So it's typically strings, UUIDs, URIs. Sometimes you don't have an external identifier, but you need a globally unique identifier for something. So you're making something, and you want to be able to talk about it in a globally unique way. When that happens, you're still going to use unique identity, but you're going to have to make up the UUID yourself. So you're not getting a UUID from the outside world. You're saying, hey, in order to know this, I'm going to do this on my own. And then finally, there's this notion of a programmatic name. This is what's called an ident. Programmatic names are things that programmers would type into their programs, right? as the names of variables, as the names of attributes, and so forth. And these are named with dbident. The thing that you have seen so far that's named with dbident are the attributes themselves. Right? They have a name. And in fact, all of the pieces of Datomic that have that db prefix, all are named with ident. Right? Datomic is made out of itself in that sense. So db slash add, I think, is actually uh, ident number one. And db slash retract is number two. And I can't remember what zero is. I should go and look. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. The point is they have names, and that modeling of names is done with ident. The thing to know about idents is that they are crazy fast, and they are cached in memory on every process. So let me say that again. They are crazy fast, and they are cached in memory on every process. So is it suitable to give every entity in your system an ident? No. These are for things programmers would type. So programmers type the names of attributes. Do programmers give a unique variable name to all the 10 million users of your system? Like imagine making a variable name 
for Jane and one for John and so forth. You wouldn't do that. So use dbident the way you would use a programmatic name. That's what they're for. Now, it turns out that assert and retract are not enough. If I wanted to have a transaction that added $10 to my bank account, which, by the way, I want to have that transaction. If I wanted to have a transaction that did that, I cannot get the balance of my bank account, currently negative 5, and then set it to 5. Because if I do that, what could happen in between the time that I get it and the time that I go back to set it? What could go wrong? This is the classic example in transaction processing, right? While I was doing that, somebody else came in and changed it. So we need a way to say, I would like to look at the current value of the database, and instead of asserting a raw fact, I want to assert a transformed value. I want to look at an existing value in the database. And the way that you do this is with what are called transaction functions. Transaction functions give, allow you to, instead of saying db add or db retract, you can make up your own name for a function, and you can send a list into the database that has that function name, that function will then be called with the value of the database as its first argument and then whatever else you passed in in the transaction. And that function is responsible for returning data to add to the database. I'm not going to talk any more about this today, not because it's not interesting, but because it's fairly advanced. But it is the answer to the question of how do I do more elaborate semantic things than add or attract? And the first thing is always ask yourself if you have to. Okay. What's that? Yes, you have to use ions to do this. That's correct. Yeah, you have to use ions to do this because you have to install this code in the database. It has to run inside the transaction. And furthermore, just foreshadowing, it has to be installed in the nodes that do transactions. So it doesn't do you any good to install transaction functions in a query group. Because query groups don't perform transactions. So yes, when you want to do this, you do this in Datomic Cloud by installing ions that implement these functions. And again, do you need uh, a database to test a transaction function? Well, maybe, probably, right? Because it has to actually look at the value of a database. But you can still test it locally without operating against the system. You can still say, I want to look at that value of the database and you know, do my work there. Uh, Datomic ships with two built-in transaction functions. One is named dbcas. Cas says, uh, compare and swap. You know, do this only if this is true. So this allows you to do a kind of optimistic update. So you can say, if nothing changed since I got here last, let's do that. And then retract entity takes an entity ID and expands to datums that retract everything we ever knew about that entity. So that's, you know, I want to get that entity out of here. Now, of course, it's still present. It's just retracted. When I first started teaching people about Datomic, I would spend a ton of time talking about transaction functions because it is, in fact, the most subtle part of the entire system. And so it's fun to talk about the subtle parts. But it's actually not the most fun or interesting part of transactions, which is that they are reified. Transactions in Datomic are like commits in your source control system. They're objects in and of themselves. They are objects that can have facts about them. Um, there is one created for you associated with every transaction, not with every datum. That's wrong. Um, and those uh, entities all have a property that Datomic will assign for you. So they will be assigned a TX instant, which is the time the wall clock time on the transacting node uh, when this transaction happened. But they can also have any other attributes you specify. What is this useful for? Well, it's often the case that you want to know facts about a transaction, or you would like to specify facts about a transaction, like this transaction was entered by a system admin to correct a problem, or this transaction was created via ordinary interaction via a form on the web, or this transaction came from a bulk import, or this transaction is part of a group of transactions that represent content that we don't want to publish to the website yet. All those kinds of facts are things that you want to be able to say about the transaction. And so the way that you do it is you can say things like, well, first off, datomic.tx is special. We should make this less special. Datomic.tx is a string temp ID that says always resolve this to the transaction entity. So the transaction entity is automatically going to get a dbtx instant. Now we're adding to it a publish at. 
So somebody else can go back and query the system and say, all the data in this transaction should be published at whatever date. In this case, we're saying publish that right now, so it's not that interesting, perhaps. The other thing you can do with this is when you're importing, you can set transaction instant back into the past. So you can say, you know what, I want to override the notion of time so that I can create an import that reflects the operation of a system in the past. You can only do this once. All the TX instants must be in order. So once you do your initial import, you cannot go back and change the past again. If you've ever watched Star Trek episodes, you know this is a bad idea. Right? You're not allowed to go back and change the past. Sorry, there's only one Spock. Get over it. All right. That is it for transactions. Does anybody have any questions about transactions? Yes? In this case, you use TX instance as your creation date for object or update date for object, or is it an end to pattern and it's better to create a different date from your time? This is a great question. The question is, is it OK to use dbtx instant as a created at or updated at value for, if you came from like Ruby and Rails, like created at and updated at are set on every database? It's worth it, actually. Let's just take a minute and talk about the differences between using something like uh, created at and updated at. So if you were building a Ruby and Rails app, or at least I, I haven't done it in a while, but back in the day, um, you would have in your SQL table, you would add two extra columns, created at and updated at. Um, what does that allow you to know in the future about that row? It actually tells you nothing about any one individual item in that row. It's speaking about the row in aggregate. So let's say that the thing has 10 values in it. When it says updated at yesterday, you don't know which one of the 10 values was updated yesterday. You only know that something in the 10 values was updated yesterday. When you look at created at, you do know when the row was created. So you know that the row came into existence at some particular point in time. Now let's look at what Datomic does. The TX instant on a transaction says that these datums came into existence at this time. It's a more granular piece of information. So if you tried to map that onto, let's imagine that in a traditional SQL database, just to pick a really degenerate case, you had a, a thing that had 10 columns in it. And every time you changed it, you changed a different column. So you created it initially, and you put a value in the first column, and the rest of them were null. And then you did an update that added the second column, and then an update that added the third column. Uh, with created at and updated at, you could tell that at some point it was created, and you could tell at some point it was changed. And could you tell what the values were when it was created? No. Could you tell what, the va what values were changed? No. With the uh, dbtx instant, you could say fact by fact, uh, A, have there been past values of this fact? And for every single granular fact, exactly when it came to be. Now, does that mean it is the perfect all singing, all dancing uh, way to reason about time? Absolutely not. Because the dbtx instant is about when Datomic took notice of your information. Right? It's been when the transactor took notice of informa your information. The first thing that happens is people wave their hands in the air and go, time travel database. And I'm like, don't use that word. Right? And then they think, you know what? This is going to magically know everything that you could possibly know about my domain notion of time. Right? If you have a domain notion of time that doesn't correlate exactly with when things got recorded in the system, you should record that as an attribute of data. And then the question is, where do you hang it? In Datomic, you have really cool choices, right? In most systems, where do you hang that? Well, you already made a table with slots, and it doesn't have a slot for it. Whoops. So now you make a shadow table, or you have a migration, or whatever. Um, but even then, that timestamp cannot talk about arbitrary changes. So let's imagine that you have three. This, is a great, this whole conversation is a great example of what's so terrible about relational databases. Let's imagine that you wanted to make an update that was an update to three different tables to this row in this table, these five rows in this table, and this row in that table. And let's imagine that you had used the idiom of having a created at, updated at. Well, all three of those tables would have an updated at that was the same instant. Would that tell you that those updates happened at the same time? Not exactly. Maybe, maybe two things happened within the same millisecond. Maybe two transactions completed within the same millisecond. You would still have to meta model further and say, I'm going to create a table, I don't know, what would we call it? The reified transaction table. 
and the reified transaction table would record when things happened in the system. And what would it have to join to? Everything. Right? You'd make a reified transactions table and you would have it joined to everything to give you this information. Which, by the way, is a little bit of how the backstory of Datomic started. Right? Before we built Datomic, Rich actually experimented with, can I just do this with tables? Can I just build these kinds of things out of tables that I have? Uh, and the answer is yes, but it's inconvenient and in-performant. So, which is why we ended up you know, actually building this. So no, it's, it's important to be, to really enumerate cases when you start reasoning about time. You're gonna have notions of time and you have the ability to hang those notions on entities. When you wanna hang that notion of time about entity, it doesn't break your table because you don't have tables. And you have another place to hang that notion which is on transactions. Transactions are very often the granularity that you wanna say something. It's almost always the case that everything in a transaction is about the same thing. How could it be otherwise? Why would you have put it in a transaction? if it wasn't all about the same thing, right? Even if the same thing is this is a batch import from another system, that's still a fact about the whole transaction, not a fact about any one of the entities. So being able to hang information directly on the transaction is extremely valuable. So this lab is going to take you through adding more data to the system that you started building before. So this is continuing on the steps that we did before. And this is, if you don't have to follow along on the side, if you're working down the tutorial, it's just the next four steps in the tutorial. Uh, accumulate, um, then reading again. So coming back and getting a second value of the database, then retracting, and then doing queries across history. And I will check in with you uh, in about 45 minutes and see how things are going.